You're listening to How to Stand. For more information about the show, as well as my other podcast, 17 Karat K-Pop, and how you can support both of them, visit 17 Karat K-Pop dot weebly dot com backslash how hyphen two hyphen stan dot html enjoy the show hi everybody and welcome back to how to stan today we're going to talk about something a little different but still about online activity internet culture things like that we're going to talk about some conspiracy theories with the author of off the edge flat earthers conspiracy culture and why people will believe anything She's also a co-host of the Fever Dreams podcast, one of my personal favorites, because I get to know what's going on in the conspiracy theory and right-wing online worlds without having to visit them myself. Kelly Weil, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. So could you start out for those who are unfamiliar with explaining a bit about what flat earthers are all about, what they believe, and then also how you kind of first, maybe not first heard of them, but first decided there's enough to write a book about here and I want to explore and learn more about this community. Sure. So a lot of flat earth theory is exactly what it sounds like. Flat earthers think that we live on a pancake-shaped planet, and they think that the North Pole is a little uh, island in the center, that Antarctica is an ice wall that goes around the outside, and a lot of them also think that the planet is enclosed in a dome, like a snow globe. I first came across flat earth theory when I was uh, researching far-right movements for the Daily Beast. I spend a lot of time just squatting in weird forums, just monitoring things, not participating, not even necessarily writing, but kind of getting a lay of the land. And around 2017, I started noticing a lot of these extremist forums starting to talk about flat earth. And I thought they must have been kidding. I was wondering if this was some kind of meme that I'd missed. So I started digging into it and I found out that they were actually very serious about this belief. And so I pitched to my editors a trip to a flat earth conference and I spent a couple days there. And what I found was just so uh, earth shaking (laughs) in some ways because I was in a room of 600 people who earnestly believed earth was flat and i you know wrote a few thousand words on it for publication at the time and had about 500 questions left and so that was when i started thinking about where i could go with this idea and what flat earth could tell us about other aspects of the internet and belief in online communities so that's where i went it sounds like the original theory it sounds like it's one of the first theories, like it would be something kind of old news. But it's interesting because it does seem like there's a lot of overlap with current conspiracy theories, maybe COVID related ones or 9-11 truthers. It just seems like a lot of more modern theories took from Flat Earth or like Flat Earth was a gateway for them, but it's like still in the conversation. Absolutely. You know, what's so funny is this idea that Flat Earth is like a really old conspiracy theory, that it's something that we always used to believe in that round Earth is new, because it's actually sort of the reverse. I mean, many, many thousands of years ago, I think people assumed the planet was flat. But starting around 500 BC, we've been able pretty easily to determine that Earth was spherical based on pretty easy observations, pretty easy math, and that has become an accepted worldview increasingly over the ensuing couple thousand years. But flat earth theory really started to emerge again in the mid-1800s. And that's when it actually did follow a lot of those newer conspiracy patterns that you're talking about. These uh, 19th century flat earthers were doing a lot of the same things that a YouTuber would do today. You know, they'd have a a lecture series where they'd say, hey, bro, come debate me, you know, and Mm -hmm. in uh, more antiquated terms, they were uh, self-publishing their own flat earth books. So, um, you know, we really did see flat earth emerge, not as this old school theory, but as something that's actually pretty modern. This rivalry just fascinates me because I actually, I didn't grow up that far from Zion, Illinois. Hearing about that history was really interesting because I had no idea. Could you share a little about John Dowie and the whole, basically an attempted coup in the Flat Earth community? Sure. So, okay, Zion, Illinois. So you'll know better than me. It's still a real city. It's still around today. I talked to lots of Zion people for the research of this book and everyone was really nice. 
But during its founding around the turn of the 20th century, it was an explicitly religious town, very fundamentalist. And it emerged out of this faith healing movement. This church got a lot of money by pretending to cure people's cancers, things like that. And they settled down to make their headquarters, basically, in this brand new city where they would be able to write their laws and control how land was used, etc. But what happened was a few years after the town's founding, which was it was founded under um, the influence of a priest named uh, John Dowie, he was kind of the founder of this church. He was overthrown by someone who was even more fundamentalist, even more out there. And this guy was a pastor named Wilbur Glenn Voliva, who was a flat earther and not just any flat earther he was really really weird like he claimed to only survive on brazil nuts and buttermilk he had these crazy strict uh religious codes for himself and others but he used conspiracy theories to uh discredit his rival to discredit john doe he would imply that john doe was actually an agent of the devil and and it really sank this guy in the last years of his life So Volvo was able to take over and not long after he gained control of the church and control of the town, he started implementing flat earth belief. He put it in the schools and he would do things like outlaw church hymns that reference the globe. And because he effectively turned the city against the rest of the world, you know, he made it such an insular community at odds with everyone else. He was able to keep power for a couple decades. What's so interesting to me hearing that was about how it feels like it's just repeating itself because yeah, you mentioned how he's like, you know, adding this flat earth belief into school curriculum and stuff. And now we're basically just having another reiteration of, well, I guess it's more the opposite of getting rid of stuff out of school curriculum, but it's like the same debate about indoctrinating people the right way, I guess. I mean, it just seems like the same thing keeps happening, you know? It's- yeah, no, it's very real. I mean, it's it's sad, but it's true. Like how often this idea of we've got to save the children is actually just a proxy for how adults want to view the world. In this case, it was a very literal means of ruling. They banned the globe in school classrooms. It's funny. One of the ways that Zion nearly fell out of this church's control fairly early on was the Illinois Department of Education saw this flat earth curriculum in the schools and they're like, I don't think you can do that. You know, that that doesn't sound right. Rather than kowtow to the state, Valva just said, okay, cool, I'm going to basically dismantle the public schools and replace them with a privately run religious institution that could do really whatever it wanted. And so those parallels to today where we're seeing this all out assault, not just on the curriculum in public schools, but even on the idea that we can have public schools at all, that has very neat parallels to what was happening in this kind of under the radar town in the early 1900s. Yeah, for sure. Switching gears a little bit, because before talking about some more present day stuff, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about this Lady Blount character, because she kind of fascinates me, (laughs) and what she did to kind of get people to support the Flat Earth cause, how she got their attention. Sure. Yeah. Lady Blunt, uh, she ruled, frankly. Um, (laughs) She was the leader of a very short-lived Flat Earth group in the UK, uh, end of the 19th century. And she was an eccentric. You know, I made the comparison before to how a lot of early flat earthers wouldn't have been out of place on YouTube, but that is especially true, I think, of her because she didn't just preach flat earth. She had a really uh, zany multimedia approach. She wrote like a novel about flat earth. She wrote songs about flat earth and she would incorporate those songs in her novel. You're reading through the book and suddenly you hit a page of sheet music and it's (laughs) so you can sing along to the flat earth song that the character is about to burst into it's really weird and i actually appreciate it even though i don't agree with any of her uh, (laughs) fundamentals but she was um yeah a very colorful character again in a parallel to a lot of youtubers someone who had a lot of money and too much time on her hands but she was kind of a steward of the movement for a few years Again, it's almost like a, the present day parallels are like too clear of online personalities kind of doing the same, the same stuff they used to. 
What interests me so much about that is how it seems like so many conspiracy theories and stuff, you know, QAnon and stuff are very anti-celebrity, like everything anti-Hollywood, call, you know, everyone in Hollywood is a criminal, all that stuff. But at the same time, it seems like they really like certain celebrities. Like it seems like they really love when certain stars uplift their cause, like the Netflix doc about Flat Earth was really viewed as like a saving grace for them and helped boost their popularity again. It's just so interesting to to me how they simultaneously don't like the Hollywood establishment, quote unquote, but they also really like the shout outs. Can you talk a bit about how you put that in the book? Sure. Yeah. So I think a lot of conspiracy theorists don't like establishment anything or they claim not to because most authorities or most institutions are in really frank disagreement with them. There aren't many flat earthers in Hollywood, for instance, but they love it when uh, Kyrie Irving comes out and says he might be a flat earther. So in in some levels, it's really just hypocrisy, right? They want people who will believe with them. But a lot of conspiracy theories, especially Flat Earth, thrive off micro-celebrity. They have these little little lords within their own community, YouTubers and Flat Earth authors, things like that. When they are railing against, oh, you know, the evil Hollywood elite who are drinking baby's blood or whatever, they're not so much just picking on those actors because they don't like them. They understand that in order to build up this alternate universe that they inhabit, that they have to tear down or discredit the existing cultural hegemony or whatever you want to call it. They get a lot of momentum out of attacking celebrities and by uplifting alternate voices in their place, be that, you know, a celebrity who has flirted with their theory or someone who wouldn't even be a celebrity at all in the outside world, but a YouTuber who's very popular in a conspiracy scene, things like that. It's interesting because it seems like there's just such a, I guess this is like a hallmark of all conspiracies, this cognitive dissonance of, and the hypocrisy. And, you know, in another area you see that is like, It seems like one thing that unites all types of conspiracy theorists is the sense of being ostracized or looking for community, like-minded people. But then at the same time, it feels like they're so quick to turn on each other. Can you talk a bit about how you describe that in the book with flat earthers and turning on each other? Absolutely. And it is so weird, right? Because you would think that in a small community like this, you would really treasure anyone who agrees with you. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't always turn out to be the case. And I think a lot of conspiracy theorists are fairly suspicious by nature, right? They're looking for reasons that people are out to get them or that there's some kind of plot against them. And so when there are minor social feuds, things that you see all the time on YouTube and just things that happen naturally in friend groups, those take on this tinge of conspiratorial belief. It's not just that your friend is two-faced. It's that, oh, maybe she literally has two faces. Maybe she's a lizard person. Or, you know, you disagree with somebody's personal take on Flat Earth. So you say that they are a CIA op and they're just there to discredit the movement. So you get this kind of conspiratorial thinking really tearing apart social groups in a way that I would hope healthier social movements would be able to remedy on their own. But in this case, there's no real venue for de-escalation. There's no real off-ramp. People just keep making conspiracy theories about each other. It's pretty toxic in that way. Yeah, it seems like it can be that way too, even in person. Because, I mean, you mentioned in the book there was physical fighting breaking out really early on, it sounds like. There was. And so I did see a couple physical fights at the most recent Flat Earth conference I was at. And, you know, it's hard to tell exactly what happened because there were conflicting narratives there. In one case, it does seem like it was someone who was from outside the conference and was just like, you know, heckling this guy and it turned into a fist fight. But again, you know, a lot of these folks don't really have the most balanced or mild approaches to conflict. So rather than be like, hey, man, like, whatever, I don't agree with you, but leave me alone. It turns into this real need to defend oneself and one's belief. And in this case, two fist fights in the lobby of a Sheraton in in Dallas is pretty uh, uncomfortable. Right, because it seems like it just made me think of that. I believe it was John Doey. It was some character in the book who wouldn't even like show up for his own debate. The lack of ability to face inconvenient truths or to even argue your point, you know, it's all, it just feels reactionary. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that was um that was the Flat Earth founder, um, Samuel Raubotham. One point he had a two nights extravaganza and some people started questioning him early on and questions he couldn't answer. And rather than try and, you know, defend the theory with facts and logic, he just bailed, you know. Yeah. I think one thing that I tried to get at in this book is that the facts and logic simply aren't there for most conspiracy theories. They're not there for flat earth. And so instead, what this really is, is a very emotionally driven phenomena for these people. It becomes part of their identity. And if you are a flat earther who feels like you're being bullied, you know, again, at this hotel conference center, rather than try and have a debate because these people know they'll lose, it turned into something really tense and a couple fistfights in a cafeteria. (laughs) Right. And how do they know how to handle that frustration effectively? You know, if they're, they're just online and they're just spending their time online when they're finally faced with someone else, they may not know what else to do. I think that's a large component of it, right, is online can be so escalatory. You don't have to learn how to deal with people with opposite opinions. You can just flame until someone flames out. And that just doesn't work in the real world. Someone's going to throw a punch or someone's just going to walk away from you. So, you know, these communities don't really teach helpful coping tactics. Right. Can you explain a little bit about how This was just so shocking to read. Like the Flat Earth Conference really wants to make sure that everyone knows they have nothing to do with the Flat Earth Society. They really like don't like each other. Yeah, absolutely. So to your earlier point about these, what seem like really minor schisms turning into big feuds, the Flat Earth Society has been around in some elements since the 1950s. It's changed ownership a few times. It's not a straight line. But the current Flat Earth movement, or I'm sorry, the current Flat Earth Society is actually pretty hands-off. I sometimes even have a little bit of doubts that its founder was serious in his beliefs. Like, there's kind of a trolley element to it. Some people are definitely serious, but they don't hold conferences. They're not militant in their belief like a lot of other Flat Earthers are. And so that's allowed the people who have these Flat Earth conferences to claim that the Flat Earth Society is a big operation against them. It's meant to discredit them and make them look bad. And frankly, if you look at both of them side by side, they both look ridiculous. So I don't, I don't <laughs> think it's uh, you know, a government op. But conspiracy theorists often have this us versus them mentality. And they like to believe that they are being acted against, that they're being suppressed, and that there's a plot to keep them from getting the truth out there. And so for a lot of flat earthers at these conferences, the flat earth society almost acts as that foil and they don't want to be associated with them because they think that it is ridiculous, that it is a government funded intelligence agency when it probably runs the gamut from people being serious to people having a laugh online and moving on. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you have, I mean, obviously not a for sure estimate, but a guess about like what percentage of flat earthers are like the real, real believers and how many are just kind of faking it for money or for fame or for some other reason? I would say not many flat earthers are faking it. People who might be faking it, I think Tila Tequila probably did it for attention. And, you know, some people are probably trolling in the Flat Earth Society. But the thing about most Flat Earthers that I encountered, and certainly almost everyone that I talked to in this book, is that this is a theory that really costs them. It's not an inconsequential joke that they can pick up and leave. They spend a lot of money on this theory, and they lose a lot of social standing over it. So they kind of suffer for their beliefs in a weird way. So I don't have firm numbers on exactly how many people are in the Flat Earth movement, but I can tell you that I've been to Flat Earth conferences where there are 600 devoted attendees present. And I think all of those people are either, you know, they're between 90 to 100 percent convinced in the theory. And there's certainly a lot more people than them who just didn't have the resources to travel there. My impression of it, a lot of other theories, I feel like so many, a huge chunk of them are in it for the grift people on TV and stuff, I just don't believe they believe what they're saying and what they're selling. But it seems like Flat Earth is different. Like these people really, really believe this. I think Flat Earth is pretty uniquely positioned in that respect, because to be a Flat Earther is to be a pretty diehard conspiracy theorist. It's not something that can really safely coexist with a mainstream view of reality. 
there's so many people on the left who sort of like do 9-11 truth posts. And it's hard to tell if they're like really serious or if that's just, they're just tweeting like jet fuel can't melt steel beams. And I bring that up because you can talk like that and still kind of exist in normative social spheres. If you start going on about flat earth, you're on your own. People are not especially compatible with that. Yeah, people, Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really fit in with most people's beliefs. And so most flat earthers, I think, or most flat earth influencers have to be pretty dedicated to the theory because it won't have a large audience like, oh, I don't know, a medical hoax would, right? Where you don't have to personally believe in the snake oil you're selling, but it will have a large audience that might be interested in buying it. Flat Earth is a narrow but dedicated community and people who commit really do it all the way. Yeah. In the cases where there is a grifter involved, though, they fall for it multiple times. I mean, you write in the book about, you know, there's this Bitcoin scammer and there are others who just, you know, they just keep keep doing it. I guess I'm just wondering, like, in general, if there's common ground among all types of conspiracy theorists about the susceptibility to just getting scammed by these people. Conspiracy theorists desperately want to believe. And again, you know, we have to go back to the emotional reasons for that. It's not just because they think that conspiracy theory has the best evidence, but because it suggests something that they really want to be true about the world. You know, there actually have been a couple flat earth scammers who are not actual flat earth believers at all, but who would offer things like, hey, give me $10,000 and I'll take you to a trip to the edge of the world, the ice wall, you know? And of course, there's people cut and run with the money. And that kind of scam sounds so obvious to you and me. Obviously, there's no ice wall and you can't go there. But for flat earthers, they are really desperate for proof. And they want to be the person who revealed this massive truth to the rest of the world. And so when they're so invested in this reality... It becomes very alluring to believe something like that. And again, they're not being governed by smart budgeting decisions. They're being governed by their emotions. Right. I have a couple related questions to that. One is about if you could just share for the listeners a bit about who Mike Hughes was and that that whole story. And then relatedly, I'm wondering if you thought maybe he's an example of the type of people who maybe they, it, it's true that it starts out like his PR person said as kind of publicity to say that he believes this, but they become truthers. They start believing it so much that they kind of convince themselves. Yeah, it's it's very easy to get pilled on these things, so to speak, when your your money comes from it. Mike Hughes was, uh, he was an amateur rocket stuntman, and he was, for many years, one of the most visible faces of the Flat Earth Movement. He had this idea that he was going to build a steam-propelled rocket, and he would launch himself up in the air high enough so that he could take a picture of the Earth's curvature or lack thereof, and that would be the end of the debate. He had a couple launches that went okay. He never went high enough to take that picture. And in February 2020, he had a launch that went terribly wrong and he died on impact. After he died, there came this debate about exactly how sincere he was, which he'd always professed to be serious about. And, you know, we were in contact for a year and a half talking about these beliefs. His publicist said that Mike hadn't really been a flat earther, that he was just hanging on to this theory for attention. And when I broached that idea to a lot of Mike's friends, including those who weren't flat earthers, they pushed back on that. And they said that, yes, Mike was a flat earther. We couldn't get him to stop talking about it. Maybe the best explanation I've received is from one of Mike's friends who was there the day of his death and who said, okay, yeah, in the beginning, Mike wasn't all in on this theory. He did think it was a wacky, kind of a a good way to get his name out there. Although Mike was a genuine conspiracy theorist about some other things. But what this friend told me is that over time, after associating himself with Flat Earth so much, spending so much time with the movement, that Mike became convinced and that his beliefs were sincere. I had other friends of Mike point out Mike did Flat Earth experiments that he didn't publicize, that he actually went into debt to throw a Flat Earth conference. So, you know, I'm left with this idea that he was very dedicated to this cause. It was something that he either did believe in or thought was worthwhile, but that It's hard to completely disentangle his belief from his profit motive. Yeah, and and if his stuff is inevitably going to get attention, then how do you sever that from what he's just doing because he believes it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, he, I can tell you that he was actually a conspiracy theorist about a lot of things. You know, we talked about the evolution of his beliefs when he was alive and he actually went to jail because he believed in this conspiracy theory about filing fake legal claims and he believed it so wholeheartedly he got arrested for, you know, just annoying the court. So one good indicator of someone's ability to believe a conspiracy theory is whether they believe in another conspiracy theory. And I would say that he certainly fit that profile and that he was someone I would say would be susceptible to flat earth. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there is so much overlap. One theory leads into another and another. And could you talk a bit about what you spend the latter part of the book talking about, which is It seems to be this increasing overlap, not just with conspiracy beliefs, but the right wing online ecosystem, basically. It just feels like it's getting more and more like a its own world, its own bubble. Like if you're not, if you don't know what's going on in right wing media, their conversations are gibberish. It just Mm -hmm. feels like over time there has been that overlap. And I guess I'm thinking specifically about there was this one conspiracy blogger who introduced Alex Jones to flat earth beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Broadly, yes. I mean, conspiracy theories don't just serve to suggest something wacky and then walk away, right? Flat Earth isn't just about saying, hey guys, we live on a pizza-shaped planet. Okay, thanks. So much of its energy is involved in discrediting formal ideas of truth, discrediting mainstream institutions. And that's really valuable for a lot of nefarious actors. That's really valuable for the far right. So even though something like Flat Earth doesn't need to be political, it has a lot of fans on the extreme right, neo-Nazi circles. And I think part of that is because it is a vehicle for massive mistrust. It lets people discard any information they don't want to believe and bring in their own new facts. And I think you're right to draw a parallel to more mainstream right-wing media here because these institutions are almost using their own language at this point. They have spent so much time shaking people's faith in the Democratic Party or the CDC, things like that, that they um, are able to rewrite the universe the way that they want it to appear. And so for this reason, I think you see a lot of overlap between really strange conspiracy communities and more run-of-the-mill right-wing talking points. They are both existing in this sphere of increasing unreality. Do you think it's just it's just going to inherently get worse. They're going to become more and more tangled as opposed to the opposite because it feels like we're at this point of no return with be, if you if you get into that that bubble that echo chamber of right wing media and conspiracy influences, it just feels like it's getting harder to get out. It's frustrating because I don't think that it necessarily needs to be that way. It shouldn't have to be a one way path down the rabbit hole. But I think what's making it a lot harder for people to extricate themselves from conspiracy communities is the fact that a lot more powerful institutions are picking up on that. We have a political party that has completely and wholeheartedly embraced a lie about the 2020 election. The Republicans increasingly say in more mainstream outlets that they think Trump won. Obviously, that's not true. But when you have such a reality-shaking claim at the core of a political platform, I think it really serves to delegitimize a lot of other shared truths. And we have this moment where we have almost diverging realities. People can pick whichever one they prefer. And so rather than, you know, allowing people to dip their toe in a conspiracy theory and come back and say, well, that was fun, but, you know, I don't actually believe that, these conspiracy theories are becoming very entangled with identity. You know, if you are a Republican, you believe in these core facts, regardless of whether they're true. But that's increasingly the case for a lot of Trump supporters. I think when we talk about bringing us back to some collective sanity, we have to look at those powerful players and get them to back off before we go after, you know, run-of-the-mill flat earthers. Do you think maybe part of the the fact that it's becoming more core to people's identity to believe this stuff may be kind of also why there is this overlap increasing but really extreme like Nazi groups online and like really hateful groups? That too is like more than a belief that some people are inferior. That's the core of their identity. That's who they think they 
there seems to be a lot of parallels with the mentality of hate group members, outright hate group members, and conspiracy groups. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of hate groups are very canny about recruiting people from possibly sympathetic conspiracy movements. You know, one thing that I talked about in this book was seeing a growing overlap between something like Flat Earth, which isn't inherently political, and something like QAnon, which is inherently very political. I think a lot of its claims at the core are sort of fascist. And I was at a Flat Earth conference, and two women approached me and tried to give me a QAnon bracelet. And I'm like, what's with this? Are you Flat Earthers? And they're like, no, but we go to events where we think people might be interested in QAnon, and we try and spread the word. So that in its way was very cynical, but probably smart and that they knew that there was this potential overlap between people who broadly mistrusted the world and people who might buy into a really, really far-right conspiracy theory. To your point about outright hate groups, neo-Nazi groups, those are often very steeped in conspiracy theory themselves. They have victim mentalities. They find scapegoats for who they think is acting against them. They have all kinds of misinformation that props up their hate. So I think all of these are, you know, kind of compatible actors in a broader unreality that they inhabit. Yeah. A really interesting time to have this conversation because as of recording time, Elon Musk just bought Twitter. So that could have a lot of implications. But I was just curious about what should be done about this misinformation that's allowed to spread. And I'm constantly turning over in my head what I think about this because I do worry sometimes about platform censorship and how that might just get people to dig in their heels and say, I'm being censored and it gives them a reason to say, oh, look, see, I'm right I'm right about them trying to suppress our important movement. And I just worry it kind of is counterintuitive to deplatform people but then again, you do point out in the book, deplatforming does kind of help curb the misinformation. So I'm just curious how you think about the implications of deplatforming and what to do about this. It's a really challenging question. And it's one that I think in the book, I maybe, maybe weaseled my way out of prescribing a single solution. You know, there's a couple things that might clash, but are also true independently. And one is that when Alex Jones was kicked off a lot of platforms, he said that that would make him more famous than ever. It would, you know, wake people up and realize that the truth was being suppressed. The opposite happened. His traffic has plummeted. You know, he's not getting nearly as many eyeballs losing all his money in court that's somewhat unrelated. So that was a really successful deplatforming story. But I think you are right to note that people do dig in their heels when they feel like they're meeting opposition. It's why it's so hard to uh, debate a flat earther into changing their mind is because they're not really there to be persuaded. They're there to feel that tension with someone of opposite belief. And so when you deplatform people, often they will find a reason to say that that actually validates their beliefs. That said, there are legitimate and immediate harms posed by misinformation. I think medical misinformation is certainly a, a very strong case for instant removal. Telling people to inject bleach to fight coronavirus, I think, yeah. is imminently harmful. And the other counter to that, I will say, though, is that these platforms, you know, they moderation is a series of decisions, right? And when these platforms take down, oh, say, the Proud Boys account, they often will make it what they think is an equal and opposite action against the left. So Facebook takes down a Proud Boys account. They simultaneously take down a large anarchist publisher page that I would argue is not nearly doing you know, the damage that the Proud Boys do. So it's challenging. And I think we need to understand that even if there is a case to be made for deplatforming certain bad information and certain bad actors, that we're also setting up the structures for that to happen to groups that don't deserve it. Dissenting voices in authoritarian regimes, things like that. So it's something that I'm very cautious about prescribing, even though I can look at a case like Infowars and Alex Jones and say, eh, yeah, the deplatforming in their case was really successful. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, there isn't one clear answer. It's, I feel like maybe the conversation should be separate, separate two things. One is the actual information people can post and then the actual amplification of what they posted and how the algorithms affect the reach of that information. I feel like that maybe should even be a separate conversation. I don't know. 
I no, I think that's exactly right. Actually, um, the information, like you said, is one thing, and it's something that you have to evaluate in a case by case basis. But the algorithms that social media sites, and especially sites like YouTube, use to promote certain topics, those are not neutral. They are based on what they think people will engage with. So YouTube for about five years, from 2014 to 2019, really aggressively overpromoted flat Earth simply because those videos performed very well. And that's not a case of YouTube making a decision like, should we allow flat Earth content on here? It's YouTube inadvertently giving flat Earth a lot more airtime. And so I think, you know, if you give a more even hand to how information is disseminated and what gets a a leg up and what gets downplayed, that could be kind of one way of approaching how content is disseminated on the internet. Yeah, I think part of the frustration with knowing like what to do about these beliefs, it's important to know that they're out there and not talking about the fact they're out there doesn't make them go away. That being said, I'm just wondering how you think about, in general, just reporting on this stuff and these beliefs. And are there certain ways that maybe social media companies, but also just other journalists could be doing better? How do you cover this stuff in a way that is responsible? I do see value in this kind of reporting about conspiracy groups, but also, you know, giving them too much airtime or too much of a platform can backfire. I'm just wondering how you how you deal with that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's something that I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about and constantly considering in my approach. My philosophy toward it is this. You are right that ignoring these issues does not make them go away. Often, I think they very much need sunlight and they need understanding and exposure. When I cover a conspiracy movement or a far-right movement, I don't just cover it because it's weird. You know, I don't want to just report, hey, here's a thing. Here's something that sounds funny. Let's go laugh about it. Typically, my threshold for reporting is, okay, is it connected to power in some way? Is it connected to profit in some way? Is it doing imminent damage? And so when I write about stop the steal conspiracy theories, you know, conspiracy theories about the 2020 election, I'm not just picking out a uh, a random right wing theory that doesn't need any more airtime. I'll write about it if it's being promoted by a local city council or something in a way that's going to affect how future elections are being run, or if maybe there's some kind of grifter who's making millions from selling this kind of fraud. And so I think looking at journalism is almost an intervention in some cases, you know, giving lights where people might not necessarily want it rather than just noting that a thing exists. And again, it's something that I grapple with and a lot of other reporters on this beat do as well. But right now, that's sort of my guiding principle. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, as you were saying that, I was just thinking about one of your latest pieces I read, which was about this med bed thing. Could you explain to people what that is and maybe use that as an example of why this was worth reporting on? Happy to. Yeah. Okay. So poof. This is a grim one. So basically for at least a year now, a lot of QAnon fans have believed that there is a technology called a med bed. And that it's basically the holy grail, you know, it will, it can do aging in reverse, you can regrow missing limbs, you'll, it'll cure all your ailments, just like by lying down in it. And of course, that doesn't exist. But there are harms suggested by it. You'll go into QAnon forums and people are saying, well, you know, my mom's really sick, but we're gonna put off her care because I know Trump is gonna reveal the med beds any day now. And that's really grim. And so I've watched that for a while and been like, "Mm, do I say anything? And I didn't for a bit. But what sort of tipped me uh, over the threshold there was I started seeing companies claiming to sell med beds and claim to sell med beds for tens of thousands of dollars and people promoting these in QAnon forums. Even in one case, I found someone who was an affiliate marketer for this company and promoting it in QAnon forums and people think, oh, wow, they're finally here. And wow. I said, that is gummy. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Because there is a real risk of people not getting the care they need because they think that they're going to get a mirror cure or people spending all the money they can possibly afford on one of these beds, which costs $20,000. In that case, you know, I thought there was enough uh, potential harm. 
Exactly. And there was enough, you know, profit being made off of these things to justify something like an intervention. And so I dug in and I found that these inventions, the inventor previously had a run in with the FTC for false advertising. Another one was just making absolutely absurd claims that defied the laws of physics. And so using that as a way in to kind of try and break the spell. And I'm happy with how that story came out. That's a good example of this. Would you mind sharing a few other examples if you can think of any of just, I just get very frustrated when some people view it as just, come on, this is just online activity. Like, why why do people even cover this? Like, it just seems frivolous reporting on internet culture. And I just feel like it's so important to stress that it has such real world implications. So I, I wondered if you could share some examples of here's when our reporting did have a real world impact, or here's when it here are the concrete things that happen because of things that happen, you know, quote unquote, just online. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would point to this whole, you know, school board panic right now as an example, because I was you know, reporting on some of the underlying anti-gay, anti-black narratives that were being pushed about this. And I had people say, well, why are you amplifying these weirdos, right? They're just showing up at local far right rally and they'll yell themselves tired and go home. Well, fast forward, not even six months. And these people are running for school boards. They are setting policy in Florida and Oklahoma, things that are actively ruinous to LGBT youth, excuse me, LGBTQ youth and teachers of color. That's why I think, you know, it's important not just to watch the fringes, but to keep an eye on their influence on the real world. And I think I've been doing this for quite a while now. You know, I wouldn't ever amplify a neo-Nazi podcast just because it said something wacky. But around 2018, I found that this one white supremacist group was talking about infiltrating local Republican parties by, you know, putting on a clean face. And what do you know? I found one of them doing exactly that in practice in Washington, using the tactics on that podcast to win an uncontested seat in his local party. And my reporting got him kicked out. So, you know, it's always a balance between is this going to give them attention that they want? And is this going to shine a light on them in a way that they're going to flinch from? And I certainly hope that it's usually the latter. Yeah, it's kind of like a nip this in the bud situation. Like, let's pay attention to what they're trying to do before they do it in a legal way. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's whack-a-mole. And it's difficult right now because there's such a deluge of this really awful information. There's such a deluge of people saying very hateful things. And you have to kind of predict exactly which of these is going to show up in legislation a month from now. Which of these people has Coke money, for example, like funding them. And so it's a lot to monitor. But if anything, I think right now that threat is being underplayed in the media. So I think a lot of the uh, the caution reporters maybe rightfully demonstrated early on. I think it's uh, the red light should be flashing. Right. A lot of the things you said about these different groups um, in your book and today about they distrust institutions. They they seek a miracle cure. They seek a, a quick and easy fix to something. They seek fellow believers who will help them, who will not treat them as outcasts. Like all these things just feel so, I don't know, core to being human. And it's not like they have a, a set of traits abnormal. So I guess my related question is that are, I, are we all susceptible to these beliefs? How do we... I mean, not believe them because it feels like it's it's so much harder to get out of believing this stuff than it is to get sucked in. To a degree, we certainly are susceptible, right? And conspiracy thinking is just a way of looking for an alternate answer when we don't have enough information or we don't like the information we have. Just because we have that tendency, we're not doomed to conspiratorial thinking. And often people who really get drawn into it further are people who might um, be looking for reasons to feel better about themselves or a group that they identify with. They might be looking for an alternate reality because they don't like recent events or what they suggest. No one is doomed to this kind of thinking. And I think when we talk about drawing people out of conspiracy thinking, we should be looking toward those similarities. Flat earthers do not respond well if you try and debate them or ridicule them into changing their minds. Like we've said before, this becomes part of their identity. So when you attack the theory, you attack part of how they view themselves. 
Instead, what I think is helpful is looking at the emotional reasons that they went for this theory. Maybe what were they scared of or what were they seeking? And often I've found that people, there was this one flat earther who said that before she found flat earth, she was very scared of her place in the universe because it felt so large and expansive and she didn't feel in connection with God in that respect. And I'm certainly not a religious scholar, but there's probably another framework that somebody could have offered her there that was less damaging than flat earth or I met a lot of flat earthers who are really into it for the community. They like the friends that they made there. And ironically, they've alienated real world friends from this belief. So they become even more invested in it. And so rather than push those people away, even though it can be kind of tempting, trying to find a way to reincorporate them into healthy society, into friend groups, into hobbies that are not harmful. And one of my favorite anecdotes about this, which I can't prove is true, but it was kind of a viral Reddit thing, is someone said that their aunt, I think, had been super into QAnon and had been super into the online camaraderie of it. And maybe to the to the point of your uh, podcast title here, she became really into K-pop. She she became a stan. Oh, I and saw this. Yeah. Yes. And you know, that group, that group identity and K-pop stands are like often making fan cams and just that generative energy really replaced QAnon for her. She wasn't yeah. just looking for that theory. She was looking for belonging was my read. And so <laughs> that's something that I personally am emotionally invested in believing that story is true. Yeah, I know. I would believe it if it is, because I mean, I do think at the end of the day, it is the ticket to helping anyone get out of this type of thinking is penetrating that bubble and substituting what they're into with with something else that meets the same need. Absolutely. Yeah. If, you know, if they're into it for the puzzle, the idea that they're on a treasure hunt and they're finding truths, get them into Wordle or something. Yeah. Um, if they're looking for community, get them into K-pop and these beliefs are not necessarily natural. So hopefully there is a substitute that does less harm. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a really interesting conversation. So thank you so much for being here. And real quick before uh, signing off, is there anything you want to plug Any social media, fever dreams or the book? Always plugging the book. It's called Off the Edge, Flat Earthers, Conspiracy Culture, and Why People Will Believe Anything. And I also have a podcast at The Daily Beast. It's called Fever Dreams. And we talk about all the uh, very savory characters on the far right and uh, how that media ecosystem works. All right. Well, thank you again so much for doing this. Thank you for having me.